So hello everyone and uh, welcome to the software metadata and containerization session of the Dataverse community meeting. So everyone who is in Europe, good afternoon. And for people in the States, good morning. Thank you for joining. So this session uh, is going to be uh, primarily on, um, so how do we prioritize and incorporate research software, containers and workflows in Dataverse repositories? So that's maybe like a better description of what this session is going to be about. However, uh, first I'm going to introduce the session agenda. So what we're going to uh, do today, and then um, I will uh, uh, go back to motivation on, on, this, uh, on this topic. So uh, me and Oliver, uh, the session co-chair, we are going to introduce the session premise, and he's going to introduce the project Hermes. After that, you're going to have three expert talks. So thank you so much for joining guys. And um, in the end, we will have a Q and A and also open discussion. Uh, so keep your questions for, for the second part of the, of the session. And that uh, the session is going to be chaired by Dorothy, who is also one of the co-chairs. Uh, so session premise. So why do we have this session? So um, I think that this is important because we have people coming from different fields and it is kind of like important to understand what, we, what problems we face here at Dataverse. So at Dataverse, people and researchers, students, they publish replication data sets or other data sets. So these are typically a bundle of data code and other files needed to reproduce a published study or some part of it. Um, or that was even just used in, in a published study or in a other research study. Uh, and this is particularly relevant for, for journals. So here are, for example, um, political analysis and AJPS that have their own collections. And on the right-hand side, you can see how this land landing page looks on Dataverse. It has some of the basic information like the authors, description, but also Dataverse metrics, uh, badges, and of course, uh, code documentation and other files. So, however, we see that um, we observe every year higher share of data sets that have research code. So research code are code files or scripts developed by researchers with a goal of obtaining scientific insights. So here in 2010, we see that there were around 15% of these 50% uh, um, uh, of the data sets containing code, but today there is almost 40%. So that is something that we need to support in Dataverse. We need to support this increase of code. And the code is there to enable reproducibility. So that is obtaining consistent computational results using the same input data steps, code and computational steps, according to the definition. Uh, so some months ago, we've conducted a large scale analysis on data sets from Harvard Dataverse repository to examine uh, execution and quality of R and Python code. So here on the right hand side, you can see a schema. So essentially uh, uh, um, packages were retrieved and re-executed blindly automatically in a prepared Docker environment. And these are the results. So we can see that the re-execution rate in R and Python with uh, uh, Python 2 and 3 is about 27% and with R, uh, several different versions is about 25%. In the middle, you can see that these re-execution rates of code is a little bit improved or well improved if we use some code cleaning. So what does that tell us? It is hard to re-execute old code and even harder to reuse it because we cannot even re-execute it. So this is the first goal of, uh, of Dataverse is to, to enable uh, publishing re-executable code and reproducible research. Right. And then we see that there is one solution to that. So that solution is containerization. However, this is often called a black box approach or it can be a black box because here we have this container and then with a single button click or a single command, we can get some results. However, um, uh, on the other hand side, we have a more transparent approach where we can right away see 
what is happening inside um, in this uh, analysis. So we can see the code, we can see data, readme. And that is something that is already uh, supported in Dataverse. So we can immediately in the landing page, we can see each, uh, each uh, code file and everything that was used in the analysis. Um, so here we come to the second goal. So we want to enable transparency and reuse over a black box approach. So on the other hand side, we want to have a re-executable code and a, a reproducible analysis, but also we want to enable transparency for, so people can reuse uh, what is there. So we have this tension and that's why we created the working group. So um, software workflows and containers working group within Dataverse identifies requirements and underta undertakes developments to support research software and reproducibility at the Dataverse project. Of course, we welcome new members and you can check out our website uh, just here. So what are the problems we are discussing? So the first discussion topic is code meta. So, so depositing software the right way. So specialized code meta is a specialized metadata schema for research code based on schema.org. We also want to enable code attribution for, for its developers, code licensing, which is different from data licensing, and, uh, and uh, yeah, these related things. And the first goal is to incorporate code meta. Our second discussion topic is uh, documentation and guidelines, tool recommendations. So for example, the Dataverse project has an extensive set of guidelines for uh, uh, rep uh, repository managers, developers, and users. And we've also created new guidelines recently for depositing, for publishing research code. So this is how the guidelines look like, and they have um, several sections. So the first section, we, uh, the first section focuses on file organization, readme, licenses. The second section focuses on capturing environment using built-in tools uh, in Python, R, and also uh, Docker. And the last section also kind of hints a little bit on code automation with bash, um, make, or uh, common virtual language. Um, our third discussion topic is a support for advanced files uh, and new infrastructures that we need to support these advanced files. So for example, if the previous topic was like low hanging fruit, something that we can do easily, something that we can do um, right away, uh, this discussion topic is maybe high hanging fruit, something that we need uh, to discuss, something that we need to really uh, yeah, think through to, to, to implement. So here uh, we can see one schema. So this is a data repository and the container repository that could potentially be built to support uh, storing containers. Okay, so here is a summary for this uh, small premise, session premise. So we want research data sets, data sets with code to be executable and reproducible, but we also want it to be transparent and reusable. So people can kind of like pick out things that they want to reuse. Um, that's why we created, um, uh, recently created a software workflows and containers working group to facilitate the effort of incorporating uh, these computational artifacts uh, like software containers and workflows. Uh, and uh, in the working group, we discuss uh, code meta guidelines, useful tools, integrations, uh, dataverse integrations, and additional infrastructure. And uh, these are also the things that we want to discuss in this session. And of course, we want to hear uh, your thoughts, opinions, and uh, what you would prioritize uh, in, in this session, so that's why we, we organize it. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, so here is uh, back to session agenda. I will now uh, leave Oliver to give another part, another part of the introduction. So Oliver, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, you all. Thank you, Anna, for this nice introduction. And um, now let me add a few words about the project I'm a part of, and that will push the boundary and burden of software depositing further. 
As you might have heard during Dan Katz's keynote on Tuesday, publication and citation of software does not become, it is an important part of research. And while open source research software is the base where the open science starship can launch its fuel, open access publications and luggage of open data, just being open is not enough. The key to visibility and credibility uh, of research software engineers and, and their work is via publications. These come in different flavors and all of them rely on making software fair. Fair software includes closed or inner source software, but um, it requires at least open and fair metadata. So how hard can it be to publish a software code? First, usually you'll set up version control, you'll do some development, and once you're satisfied, hopefully you will not forget to create a tag for your work. We have lots of good dev tools for all of this, Git, GitHub, GitLab, all those around here and uh, hopefully used by every researcher. But now there's the tough part, adding metadata. And finally, the last step of depositing uh, your uh, success and publish it. And of course, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, you'll then repeat from step two. There's a growing number of tools that tries to help you with those points four and five. I wrote some examples on the right, and there's an ever-growing number of other examples I didn't uh, put on this slide here. All of this has some automation available, but well, let's try to make this a bit easier, more, more aligned for devs, especially research software engineers. Being a developer myself, well, I just want to be lazy. How about letting an ancient god do the hard work for us? So jokes aside, Tobias Schlauch and Stefan Druskat from DLR, Oliver Knoddel and Guido Jukolan from HZDR, and myself put together Project Hermes. Hermes stands for Helmholtz Rich Metadata Software Publication. And it's funded 50% by the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration for two years, starting as of the 1st of July. So what's, what's happening there? As Hermes has been an ESA Starship project too, let's take a look under the hood of the machinery. First, Hamas will provide a CLI application that you can use with any continuous integration or continuous delivery pipeline. We will provide examples for many different CI flavors out there. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you all to use it within your project. And then eventually the tool would do three things for you. First, it will extract and gather metadata from various sources. Wrap those every, and all these, these shiny things in asteroid foil. And lastly, deliver those to your target repository via its API. So it's not limited to just one or two approaches, but we try to be agnostic. Wrapping up means here executing a configurable workflow. First of all, compile collected metadata into a code meta standardization file, standardized file, bundle the artifacts and maybe do some preliminary checks, linking to other materials and other things you can think of. Next up is, not to forget here, as we use the API of target repositories to re deposit the uh, wrapped stuff, we will interface for now, for the time of the project, with two huge upstream repository software project, which will be Dataverse and Invenior RDM. We have strong plans to work together with the communities of these open source projects and making them software ready for any installation out there because as Dataverse, well, you know, all know that, uh, is uh, pretty centric by on, on installation inside your institution. It should be also available in your institution. So what's missing from the database, the Dataverse code base to let, make it called software ready? First, there's a lack of software licenses support. There's under, work under, uh, underway to implement more flexible licenses, as you might have heard yesterday. Um, this is pull request 7920. And yet it's focusing on data licensing. It will need some tweaking for software licenses. Also more discussion is needed here to deal with multiple license on 
in, in if this is happening inside one set for data and software wrapped in one set, like Anna described. Second, it's that we need more software metadata. We need to support QR code meta as a schema. There's a pull request for that, 7877, but also export and send it towards data site while minting DOIs. And the current database, dataverse code base is highly data specific in that aspect. Third is that data set versioning as is and a good fit for software right now. Also the current versioning system for data does not fulfill this force 11 and not the data set recommendation to mint a DOI per software version and still have one DOI for the software as a whole. And lastly, which is another huge topic is that we should uh, make the textual appearances inside of Dataverse more software friendly and make software first classes as currently the UI is pretty data set centric. All right, thank you all for listening. I'll be happy to discuss some more of my ideas. Anything else? Please get in touch with me later if you want, ask questions later on. And well, Arfan, stage is yours. Well, okay, just a quick introduction. So our next speaker or the, the first invited speaker is uh, Arfan Smith. He is a staff product manager at data for data at GitHub. Uh, he has he's also an editor in chief at the Journal of Open Source Software, and he has done many interesting projects like uh, uh, Zooniverse, um, also open source journals at GitHub. But also, uh, yeah, I'm excited to hear what uh, you have been working on uh, recently, Arfan. So yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining so us. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the invite. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides okay. Yep, great. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk mostly today about sort of ways in which I've seen research uh, sort of work, scholarly work uh, being automated on GitHub. I thought that might be, um, especially for this audience, uh, might stimulate some good discussion um, especially around metadata, I think I'm not going to show you um, uh, examples here of metadata, but you could, you know, there's basically, I think, a ton of opportunity um, in the communities we work in to, to uh, leverage automation to enrich and maintain uh, scholarly metadata and a whole bunch of uh, academic work. So I'm just going to show you some examples that I think are, uh, uh, might illustrate that for you. So GitHub is, uh, you know, where we... Uh, see the largest fraction of open source uh, development happening on the planet today. Um, and really, when we think about GitHub, we often think about the, uh, the Git piece, which is completely reasonable, the version control, pull requests. I don't know if this was one of the pull requests we were just talking about, but you know, here's one on Dataverse. You know, it's this environment where people collaborate, discuss changes, improve software together online. And this is a, you know, this is sort of foundation of GitHub, this is uh, really how GitHub has been since since its inception in in 2008. But actually, GitHub is 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 more than that. Uh, there's also a whole collection of APIs. There's a uh, pretty mature now uh, REST API, uh, which is uh, in its version three, and there's also a Graph. QL API that some of you might have used. Um, one nice thing about the REST API is that it, we actually publish an open API three compliant document. So you can, uh, the Python one, there's a Python client library now that has been implemented with a very limited amount of code that basically uses the, the open API spec to sort of uh, uh, on the fly generate the, uh, the, the, the sort of interactions uh, with, all the, with all the entities in, in, in our API. There's another important piece, and this is what powers a lot of the automation uh, that I'm going to show you today, and that's GitHub Actions. So this, think of this like a sort of a, a, a compute environment that's available to you and that has deep integration with, um, with GitHub content. And so there's a concept of a runner, like a compute environment, and these can be you know, Ubuntu, Windows, Mac, or your own uh, self-hosted runners. And it's a sort of a workflow based, you describe workflows in YAML um, and you can decide what types of events you want to respond to. And these are some of the event types in the left here that, that, um, that, that you can build workflows around. But basically every time something happens on GitHub's, uh, on GitHub, our APIs kind of produce these events and you can listen into those and 
and do stuff. And so for open source projects, there's uh, absolutely tons of free minutes available for compute time to do to do that work. And there's also a fairly good quota for, for private repos uh, built in too. So I said I was going to give you five examples. So I'm going to show you first an example for a project uh, that, that I'm heavily involved with. And this is for the Journal of Open Source Software. So um, very briefly, you know, we publish short papers about research software, and those papers are written in Markdown. And so uh, one, uh, one thing that we provide to our authors who are um, planning on submitting is we provide them a, uh, a paper compilation GitHub action. So this is what it looks like on a, uh, on a repository. And when it, uh, when it basically, when, when somebody pushes a change, so here I'm making a change where I'm updating authors uh, on, a, on a markdown document, and this runs as a, a GitHub action, and as a, an artifact of the of the build of the run is is actually a paper. We produce this PDF, and this is it on the right. This runs every time somebody makes a change to their papers. So this is a way that you can collaborate and compile papers. What's happening under the hood is completely up to you. Here we're using Docker and Pandoc to go from Markdown to PDF, but you could use you could run LaTeX here to you know do something. Uh, different, the, the sort of underlying compute, whatever you're doing in your compilation step is up to you. Uh, but this is just one example of uh, producing producing uh, uh, documents on the fly. A second example I wanted to show is what I call Notebook CI. So this is continual testing, continual integration of Jupyter Notebooks. So this, uh, this is a project that is uh, being run by Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And this is the organization that is building all of the tools that the astronomy community will use to do science with NASA's uh, next flagship uh, uh, science mission. So this is uh, James Webb Space Telescope is launching later this year. It's a $10 billion investment from the US and European governments. and uh, you know, we want to make sure that there's really high quality tools, really high quality notebooks available for the community to use from the get go. And one of the challenges that uh, people face typically with notebooks is that sometimes they're hard to it's hard to be sure that it's going to work. Like when you when you download it, will this notebook work? Is it is it uh, being bundled in some kind of reproducible way? And so this is an example of uh, how this team has. Um, has addressed this. So you can see here, we've got two commits in this pull request, which was merged. The first one failed. The second uh, is actually the one that passes the commit, uh, passes the build. And that's because the second commit actually includes the dependencies, uh, NumPy, AstroPy, Matplotlib, SciPy, SpecUtils, which is one of the pieces of software that this team is authoring. And so basically the notebooks when uh, when added to this repository, they try and build the notebooks. They try and run them uh, in headless mode, execute the notebook uh, top to tail, and check that it runs without errors. And it it requires uh, they build the basically the computational environment each time to go with that uh, to execute the notebook. So they're combining the notebook with the with the specified dependencies, and then continually testing that those work. And the outcome, of course, is you know, notebooks that the community can use and uh, do things like lists, like model the uh, PSF uh, point spread function of a of the image of the gap of a uh, of the optics of the telescope. But the whole point is here is to be uh, providing a rich set of notebooks where lots of people can contribute, but that you can be sure that when you download it, you've got a good chance of being able to run it. The third. Well, example I want to give is one that you might all know. This is actually a fairly old example. Uh, this is a project I was involved with uh, some years ago uh, at GitHub, uh, where we worked with the folks at Zenodo and also Figshare to build a sort of DOI issuing uh, service for uh, for GitHub content. And so this is uh, powered by webhooks. This doesn't use GitHub Actions. This just uses the the, the sort of REST API uh, integrations and Basically, this is a fairly straightforward integration that, that anyone could do, uh, build against. The idea is that um, you can uh, deposit your software, make an archive of the software with Zenodo, issue a DOI, and associate that with the, uh, with the repository. And so this has been used uh, uh, you know, many, many thousands of times now. And the, you know, the outcome is that per every, every, uh, every release, 
that happens. This triggers the Zenodo workflow, and uh, a, you know, a DOI is issued or updated, and uh, people include those in their readmes. This is a pretty pretty popular uh, uh, integration, I think. Okay, so fourth example I wanted to show was um, some ways in which people generate reproducible compute environments on GitHub. So there's, uh, I'm going to show you a, a tool called Binder here and uh, Repo to Docker, but there's also um, GitHub has its own product here called Code Spaces, which is in a preview right now. It's not generally available, but the idea here is to build and run. Uh, uh, um, build Docker uh, container images on the fly from, from content that you find in, in a GitHub or Zenodo or GitLab or Figshare or Dataverse you know, uh, uh, repository and build that on the fly, cache the, the, the built image and then make it available and run. And so this is a project called repo to Docker, uh, which is pretty uh, descriptive. Um, and there's also a GitHub action you can use here that will um, uh, keep the container image up to date because one of the things that Binder does is it, it builds the image on the fly. So you'll see this on GitHub like this, there'll be a launch Binder button and then there'll be a requirements.txt. And again, this is a fairly short set of dependencies expressed here. Uh, matplotlib, scikit image, um, I'm not sure what that uh, dependency is, but uh, and then raster.io. And the idea is you click this button, Binder builds the container image and launches you into an interactive versioned computational environment. So in this example, those versions weren't pinned as particularly uh, tight dependencies, like you could be more uh, explicit about that, but this is just um, uh, an example of how that can work, and uh, this is with uh, Sentinel-2 data. And okay, last but not least, I want to show you a project that uh, GitHub released a few uh, weeks ago called Flat. And so this is a uh, uh, an implementation of this uh, idea that was pioneered by Simon uh, Willison called Git Scraping. So the idea here is to build a set of uh, sort of low level workflows that allow you to automatically sync data from different sources and keep them up to date and put them in a GitHub repository. So this is all built on actions and a few simple workflows. And so uh, the, the action you can install on any repository, uh, you just click the button and add the Add it to your uh, add it to your repo, and then basically you can set up rules however you like. But in this case, we've got a cron job running here. So this is a GitHub action that basically runs every every few hours or days or minutes, how often you like. And what we're doing here is we're pulling in uh, data from the Oxford COVID government response tracker repository. So we're pulling data over from that. We're persisting it in our own repository here, and then we've got a dashboard built on GitHub pages that basically renders that data and um, makes it, uh, uh, you know, you know that you've always got a live up-to-date version of this data staying up-to-date with the uh, uh, the downstream or the upstream repository. So that's my five things. Uh, hopefully that's interesting. I'm going to stick around for the session, so available to ask questions. But if uh, you want to reach out to me, um, please get in touch in one of these ways. But that's, uh, that's my lot. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. This was this was great and very informative. Thank you so much. And I, as someone who who does so much of my analysis in Jupyter notebooks, I'm very excited about this, like uh, notebook uh, CI. So yes, I th people, uh, yeah, please leave your questions in the in the chat. Um, and yeah, we can then uh, quickly go to the second speaker. So Stian uh, Soyland Reyes. I hope I'm pronouncing that well. So he is a technical architect and um, research associate at the computer science department at the University of Ma Manchester. He is co-founder uh, uh, of the research object approach and the co-lead of the research crate approach. So thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, so let's get started. So I'll talk to you a bit more about our crate. You probably heard about uh, Carol introducing this in the keynote, so I won't go through all this, the kind of introduction step about it, but basically think of it like a gathering of things and putting it in context using a formal representation and not just data, but all the other things that we also care about. So basically, we're driven from this from thinking about how to capture research outputs, because we know it's not enough to have just the PDF and, you know, data and software and all the other things. 
should be gathered together. But we also need connections between them because they're related. And to make it fair, that needs to be described also for computers and not just for humans so that you can do some machine processing upon it as well. So we have lots of tooling for our query. We have different uh, libraries. We have command line tools, these kind of things. Uh, I'll show you briefly a few of these. So for, let's take the base case. You're just uh, doing like Anna said, you've just messed about a bit in Jupyter I'm not saying you messed about, but let's say you have created some new data, but it doesn't live anywhere yet. You haven't even decided on your repository. Then you use, can use something like describe or you start describing the files you have on the file system bit by bit. And then you have already captured the metadata in a more structured form than uh, you know just a readme file. And uh, this can be used interactively and uh, on the web as well. And here you see you, you're adding up bit by bit to structured information. And uh, one example of using this in the digital humanities is uh, a nice project called Paradisec, which has been running for many years, but now they are looking at how do we actually preserve all the lovely metadata we've captured because we have, they are recording uh, cultural heritage, indigenous languages are in danger of going extinct and so on. And so you have all these recordings and books and so on, and lots of things like that. You can see here how there's so many different contributors just for one little entry. And so they need to describe this metadata, but just because they have built a lovely portal on top, they don't want to be the metadata be trapped in that portal. And so they're using our crate underneath the hood. So if you're on, on there and you're looking at where it was captured and so on, all of that is actually coming from an hour crate. So the techie, techie bits are there for those who want it. And, but that means it's also is preserved uh, from beyond the portal because you can do further processing for it. Let's think about data management plans. There are some attempts to do machine, sorry, machine actionable data management plan. And this is referring to some work which is looking at how do you connect that with, up with how you build data sets. You can think of a data management plan as a kind of template for a research object. We're saying what kind of things should you capture and what metadata should you have with it? Or the other way around, you have an exemplar of this is what the data should look like. Now please make me a machine actionable data management plan. And then you add the further edits to that. Let's think about repositories, which is why we're here today talking about Dataverse. So R-Create could be useful, sorry, for as a way of storing or for archiving and exporting and working between the different uh, repositories. There are some of the repository people are talking with, uh, including yourself as well in there with the workflow hub. And uh, we'll get a bit back to that uh, later in the talk with my thoughts on how that connects to our to Dataverse. I want to talk a bit more about uh, workflows because we have uh, done a few work with workflows. So, you know, Carol introduced the workflow hub where you can store different workflows and we can find them and so on. And we're doing this with our crate for reasons I'll show you. And those workflows themselves are composite objects. So, and we're adding more to it because we're adding metadata on the side. So for instance, a Galaxy workflow that has been described further on using various schemes and common workflow language. Just from that already, you have three resources gathering together with in an hour crate, which then gets a DOI in the workflow hub. But then there's lots of additional things around the workflow that you also could add, like uh, test data. So you have a description of how you potentially could run it. So you can put it into one of these uh, GitHub actions we just saw here, or a bit more uh, formalized, you can have something called the life monitor, which picks up the workflow R crates and then looks for the tests and then continuously run the workflows and report back how it is going. And it will need many things around the workflow as well in order to do that, you know, example inputs, what kind of engine should we test on and so on. Uh, you can think about computational tools because we know not everyone is, is loving workflow systems as much as me. So uh, it could be that you just have used some tools on the hook, you're straight on the desktop, on the terminal, or maybe on a supercomputer somewhere, but you didn't build a formal workflow. You just want to say you used some. So in our crate, you can just include that directly. So maybe you fill that in by just having links to the website of the tool and so on. That could be the simplest way in, but it's not as very reproducible because you kind of do have to be a human in order to install the software and things like that. So you haven't added in all the, all the lovely things that we have now, like containers and packages and so on. So here's an example from the Barcel project, which is paying for me to be here today. So I better mention them. Uh, we are building building blocks 
for workflow systems, for wrapping tools doing uh, molecular simulation, which is normally quite a complex thing that you have to do with very comp detailed config files and so on. You run it in HPC. So we're kind of simplifying how you do that by wrapping these tools, putting them in Biconda packages so you can be installed. You have Docker containers, so you have all the dependencies they need for running. And that means that each of these tools have kind of many different phases. It could be that it's in a Jupyter Notebook, importing a building block that then again uses a Conda package that then again has installed some tool. So you see there's a whole series of identifiers and, and wrappers, and it's not the same person and the same institution doing each of them. Each of them should kind of get credit, but of course, ultimately should be the tool authors uh, that should also get credit. So you, they shouldn't lose credit just because you use someone's nice wrapping about it. So that how do you propagate that kind of citation uh, in your tool usage? And the R credit allows you to, to have this kind of chain preserved. So if you think about running a workflow, so a workflow would then be a composition of all of these tools. So that makes it kind of more complex again, because now you have lots of these tools all being put together from many different uh, authors. And again, yes, just describing which software we use is a simple way in, but then now you would just say a workflow was run. And that is not enough because a workflow again has references to all of these different tools. Now we see our creators are kind of level in between, a kind of glue that connects to all the other things that you could and shouldn't include in a reproducible data package. But of course, you won't always have all of these things, but it depends on how much support you get from the software. So if you think about other cases, so if, you, if your work was using lots of data, how do you actually cite, cite that? So that was a discussion last week in a meeting uh, where we're talking about building our crate as a kind of in-between object for when you have maybe 100 data citation, which you're not allowed to use in a normal boring journal because they have page limits. You know, the internet's running out of pages soon, so we have to be preservative. So here the our crate can come in between as a way of wrapping again the data citations that you have used. And, but capturing again on the metadata of all the things you have used so that you have propagated their attribution. So one interesting area is the earth sciences, which are now adapting uh, our crate uh, has, uh, they're adding the kind of dimensional aspect to it. So you, you've probably seen this in data as well about how you can add out where did actually this cutting come from. And they need not just spatial coverage, temporal coverage, but even vertical coverage. Imagine you're in the rainforest, for instance, you have all the different levels that you're in. So they're expand, extending the our crate to include that. So our credit is extensible and that's why we are organizing this now into formalizing profiles. So Carl show you this slide of the many different profiles that we know already exist. Not all of them have been formalized. So some of them are kind of de facto profiles. And that is why we're now working on expressing those more formally. So you know what things to expect in a certain type of our credit. I want to do a quick dip about how you do we express things in our crate uh, because maybe, oh, sorry. Uh, Carol mentioned about how we're using schema.org and, uh, and that is basically the core vocabulary we are using. And it's in a structure that you see like that. It is basically JSON, but it's also JSON only. So it's linked data by stealth, right? So we don't have to scare all the developers saying, oh, you have to learn all the RDF models. Uh, but we are backed on the schema org uh, uh, vocabulary, which, which will give you all the definitions that we are using. But you can ex extend on that and use other vocabularies. An important aspect here is also about having a, uh, uh, sorry, a machine readable, and, but also human readable. So here you see an example of how we can render the, the metadata for human. It's kind of not as nice as what you've seen Dataverse, but it's a nice as a kind of fallback option, particularly if you're just downloading something. You don't want to look at the JSON file, you want to have a rendering. And here you can, you can delve into the different objects I've been uh, described. And these, you see these vocabulary terms have now been expanded to human readable text. So I have a little technical deep dive. I only have a couple of minutes. I won't bore you with that, but we can come back to that later if you want to look more about this scary JSON and so on. 
uh, but I wanted to have some thoughts about uh, how our crate fits into Dataverse, at least according to my quick thoughts upon that. So one example is, of course, of distributing metadata with the data. Because if you see in, in Dataverse, the, the added value you get from using a nice repository is not just you have a collection of files, but you have described the files, right? So you have now saying, why is it even there? And you have already a big selection of export metadata. Now I'm thinking, what if you add, can you also export an hour crate out of that? Now you already have export schema of JSON ID. So is it really that different? No, actually I found it to be buff number 95% of an hour crate. So it's kind of almost already there. The only big difference I had is that when you have multiple files, you list the several distributions, which I would say they are parts of the data set rather than they are the data set. So it's just a small semantic change there to make it different. So I had to go. So if, imagine you're downloading this as an as a archive from Dataverse. If you do that today, you just get the files straight in, right? And now you lost lots of things. You haven't got all that lovely metadata. It's not there anymore. You don't see the DOI. And you, you don't even know it's from Dataverse, except you know it just says the file name, Dataverse files. So it means we lost the name of the data set. Yes, we, we even lost the name of the data set. So we need to keep those things. That was the extra value we added, right? So I. Just had to go, you know, this took me five minutes where I took that R, that's JSON ID that was already there. I just renamed it R create metadata JSON and run it through one of the R create tools. And now you see, I got even the HTML uh, rendering of it. So now we have not just machine readable metadata, but also human readable metadata embedded with uh, the, the files that we have. And of course the file names are called R create something. So they're not going to be clashing with someone else's uh, existing file names, unless they were already using our crate. So again, you could just navigate in and see, in, in this case, there was not that much data you could see for each of the entries, but you couldn't at least see the people, you have a few more details and so on. And here you see when you go into a particular file, this is where you could say things like, this file actually has a different license, right? So you can add in additional attributes in our crate to describe each of the things further in detail, which might be a bit cumbersome to have, in the middle of the, the main entry, but it could be more important when someone is actually using the data rather than someone just trying to find it. So what is the other way around then? That this is if you're importing data, then of course it should be possible to import a written metadata. You shouldn't have to fill in this big form if you had already used something like the scriber to fill it in. Maybe you have an hour crate that you got from a different search system, like a workflow system. Now we already have the full list of authors and so on. Still, there could be things to fill in because people never fill in metadata unless they're forced to, but at least could be a starting point. We want to move to a model of where you have a incremental building of metadata, not just at deposit time in the very end, because it can be a bit daunting to do it all in one go, but if you can do it bit by bit as you're actually working locally, maybe you're doing self-publishing, and then Dataverse is the kind of archival option. That's where you formalize with DOI. So you can have this kind of duality. You're not bound to one place to have your data. So this ties me in, I'm now reaching the limit, so I'm almost on, uh, about how you could actually store the data with metadata. Now I haven't looked into the storage model of Dataverse, but I suspect there might be some database involved. Now I know databases are fun, but sometimes they do lock you in, right? So you have everything trapped in. So we have looked at how could you use our credit as a backend thing where it is kind of underwear, which you kind of don't see unless you force it to. So uh, we have already been using Bagit, which is a well-known way of archiving things on just files on disk, and where you add some checksums. And our credit, of course, fits straight in there because it has just a, a special file name. But then the, mag the Bagit will make sure all the files are there and they are in the correct value. That's the, the kind of the most basic way to do it. Again, you could just do this on your desktop, but you could be do it on a massive file system. A bit more formalized, but not quite the Git model, but easy, more easily dealing with massive files is using something like Oxford Common File Layout, which we have used in Paradisic. So this data I showed from Paradisic is actually coming from this uh, Oxford Common File Layout. So here you see all the checks and everything, they're there, they're straight out there. And even the R code metadata is there. So you could even, if you wanted to, go and have a look at that. So that's right in. And then, of course, integration with workflow systems. So I can, uh, we talked a bit about how Workflow Hub already assigns DOI to the workflows, but 
they're kind of not quite put in context with what is the data you're using the workflow for. So uh, if we think of some kind of mirroring or referencing in repositories like Dataverse and Zenodo, uh, I mean, how you do the identifiers here is, is a problem to be solved, but, but particularly if you're thinking workflow is part of something bigger, that something bigger would be in Dataverse, right? Because you have particular data runs, maybe you can then rerun those by throwing it directly a workflow execution service you don't need to go back through the workflow hub because the workflow is already fully preserved in the workflow our crate and that takes me to the final idea about using our crate as a kind of shopping thing if you're working around in dataverse and you're collecting different pieces of data can you then just export them together and include all the metadata in there and then our crate as i've shown before would give you that so that's it and here are all the people that are helping our crate community if you want to join uh, it's just to say hello in GitHub if you want, and then you're in. So that's it for me. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. You opened so many, so many topics, and I and all very relevant to Dataverse. So I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for you a little bit later. Uh, okay, so we can now uh, proceed uh, with our last speaker. So uh, Martin Penner, uh, he is a technical director at the uh, data site. Uh, and he has been working on uh, many different things, including implementing FAIR data, uh, also software citation and support for software, including software metadata and code meta. And we are very excited to hear, uh, hear from you, Martin. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. And it's, uh, it's amazing to start with, very excited to hear about metadata. That's an unusual, introduction. Um, one word of warning, it's so far the hottest day of the year here in Germany and my computer is really suffering. So if there's sort of problems with the uh, seeing the slides that it's really the 38 Celsius degree or something, not anything else. Um, I will talk about code meta, um, which is about Can you see my first slide? Yes, yes. Uh, we, uh, yeah, it is not full screen, but we can see it. Yeah, there it I also have the crazy idea to use a new presentation the software for slides, which I've only used a few times. So today it seems to be, but I hope you can see enough and I just continue. Um, Martin, just to let you know, we see basically we see your whole screen. So this is just taking up kind of the middle two thirds. Ah, there we go. So now that should be better, right? Yeah, awesome. Okay. So um, it's about code meta and it's about something not being right here. I think Docker is okay in a session about software. Um, and it's about standardization. And uh, the starting point with code matter is, as is sometimes the case, or often the case, a grant by the National Science Science Foundation in 2015 for these two people, Carl and Matt, um, a 12 month grant to do something about crosswalks between existing metadata schemata for software. That sounds pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, the grant started with a kickoff meeting um, at a Force 11 conference. So I think a few people on this call now have also participated in that. Um, and then what Code Matter did in the, the year, a little bit that followed is to do all these crosswalks. And this is not all the crosswalks. This is just what fits on one screen. And you see a good mix of um, different metadata standards, whether it's uh, Wikidata, data set on top, whether it's uh, specific um, languages like Python or R, which is not on this one here. And it was a very straightforward exercise um, to produce those. And the, the project learned a lot, which is, for example, what are the kind of properties that everybody thinks are necessary to describe software, what's more exotic, and, and of course, the practical aspect of crosswalking. So that was a very nice outcome. And then what happened is what always happens with metadata. And I think you have all seen this slide, but I think here it's very, very appropriate because it's really 
that's what happened after the project, of course, CodeMeta decided we need a CodeMeta metadata standards. It's not just about crosswalks anymore, but because now we know what everybody needs and how, yeah. So, so let's just create a CodeMeta metadata standard. Um, and what the project decided to do is not create it out of thin air, but first use JSON LD, which I think was still a fairly new thing at the time. Um, we're talking 2016 now, and also to reuse what exists specifically from schema.org, which of course is also using JSON LD. And then the project came up with a little over 60 metadata properties, about 50 something from schema.org, and then 10 that were sort of defined because they were not covered in schema.org, but they were deemed necessary to properly describe software. Um, sort of in, in this sort of short history of code better, the next thing that happened is um, that the Research Data Alliance created a new interest group called Software Source Code. And uh, had, this group had the initial meeting at the RDA plenary in the fall of 2017 in Montreal. And there was an interesting discussion about what kind of metadata do people use, et cetera. And I was in a room and was really surprised that basically everybody said, everybody who was sort of interesting enough in metadata about software that participating in this session, we like code meta. That's really what uh, has everything in there that we want. And this is of course not by accident, but because of all these crosswalks and all the thinking about um, so basically, I expected that this session, I, I don't know, this, that the interest group would spend the first year or two just fighting about metadata standards, which one should be better and should be used, et cetera. But it was like super boring. Code Meta was an agreement. Um, as you will know, and I will come back to this at the end, this unfortunately isn't true for the software developer community. If you ask a random software developer, or let's say research software engineer, if it's about scientific software, there is very little uh, knowledge about code meta. And if you go to, for example, GitHub and search for code meta files in repositories, you find a few hundred, I think, but it's it's sort of sort of coming to that a little bit later, but it's, it's um, metadata folks like it, but it's not as widely adopted yet. And that's one reason why this slide now, uh, several of us started a working group, which is actually, so we really have a wonderful long title. It's the FOSS 11 Software Citation Implementation Working Group Code Meta Task Force, um, where we said, let's move forward with Code Meta, let it not just exist, but it's widely usable and used. And the primary idea we had uh, something that came up uh, is, a, is an output of a fairly small grant. Um, how can this be the metadata standard that rules the software world? Uh, it needs some more feet. And that includes both the people in this working group doing work of sort of filling in gaps and sort of updating code meta standard, but also finding a home for this. And the obvious home is schema.org because it is already 90% schema.org and schema.org is of course massive, um, widely adopted, lots of people thinking about it, sort of all kinds of tools, which of course is also a challenge because schema.org has many interests and software source code is, is somewhere on the list, but maybe uh, not the top priority. But um, that didn't deter us and there were sort of number of us working on this, and I would particularly name Moran Peter from Software Heritage, who invested a lot of time in making this move forward. And where we are now, and it's sort of perfect timing, uh, is that we came up with sort of first improve the code meta standard to refine things that are in there, or sort of where mm, there's a better way to do this, and do a code meta version three. And we put out an open call and put send us to several mailing lists. Please give us feedback until June 15, which was Tuesday. And we got feedback of this, but it's 
it's also about making sure that a small task force doesn't come up with crazy ideas about metadata and nobody in the world knows about. So we gave everybody the opportunity of now something like six weeks to give their feedback. And some people, of course, did. But we didn't expect and it didn't happen that we get like hundreds of requests. It's, it's still metadata after all. And of course, Code Meta did a good job in the first place to cover really a lot of things that can be um, used to describe software source code. So what we are doing next, uh, the task force is meeting uh, in two weeks, and then uh, in the coming weeks, we will work on sort of finalizing Code Meta 3. Currently, I'm not aware of any super controversial topics. It's just to go through this and say, yeah, this is now nicely documented. And I hope that happens soon enough over the summer. And then the next big step is to push this into schema.org. Um, and who has ever worked with the schema.org community uh, understands that it's, it's not very predictable. It's a very loose way of discussions and GitHub issues, et cetera. And some things linger forever, it seems, in the uh, schema.org repo. Um, and, but I think having a community speaking with one voice and saying, this is what we suggest, and there's nothing crazy in there. And also another aspect that's important for schema.org is that we actually have people that want to implement this. It's not just the five researchers that came up with a crazy idea. Um, I will not call names, um, but uh, it definitely software heritage, data site, as sort of being involved in this group, but also other organizations, they are, they are waiting for this uh, to use it. And there is uh, maybe it's not the same traction as uh, schema.org for, I don't know, movie reservations or something that's sort of used in the wide public internet, but there's definitely uh, uh, we hope we can have some traction because, again, there isn't really any other software metadata initiative that's sort of coming up with something competing and conflicting. From my personal perspective or data side perspective, the organization I work for, the reasons, uh, some of the reasons why I like um, Code Matter and this effort to bring it into schema.org uh, is. First of all, um, these are different workflows to register content and associate metadata. Um, that's also true, something we learned and Dataverse uh, was very involved in this work where we had a project a few years ago now and that was co-chaired by Mercer Crozes and myself about embedding schema.org in data set landing pages. That's a very different workflow than registering, for example, DUI metadata somewhere. And for software source code, it's similar. It originates in a code repository and then maybe goes into an archive, like uh, for example, Zenodo or Dataverse. And that is much easier uh, sometimes with, with a different, uh, different approach to where how the metadata is expressed and where it's stored. Um, what I really like that this code matter is now becoming sort of part of schema.org is that we don't further fragment the metadata world for scholarly outputs, that there's metadata schema for all kinds of flavors. And then for software, you have to do this. And then for data, you have to do that and then so forth. But it's really part of at least schema.org, which works reasonably well for data sets and, and other metadata to describe things that are relevant. Um, and lastly, independent of whatever however you do this, or whether you use schema.org. This is about standardizing metadata for research software. And I hope you are aware that this is not a given. For many, most things, and that's the nature of metadata, there's, I don't know, half a dozen, one dozen, two dozen different standards that sort of do similar things, but they all have their little, little take on this. And I think we can be proud as a, software metadata community that we decide let's just do one thing and agree on this because um, this enables uh, that these metadata pass around with, with all kinds of between all kinds of different systems which out without having extra hurdles of metadata crosswalks or, or other things um, and with that i have the last slide which is where we're moving next. And I think what I sort of hinted at earlier, 
there's still a lot of work to do. Well, this is all fine, but if I write my code now and I want to add code meta metadata to my, for example, GitHub repository, how do I do that? And I listed four tools here. I think the most practical one might be code meta generator, which is from Software Heritage, which is basically a web-based form where you can uh, enter metadata that are not automatically part of a code repository, for example, um, author names and author information, and then can generate a code meta JSON file that you can store in your repository. Bolognese is, um, in this case, it's a library that Dataside wrote, which is about mapping all kinds of metadata. So basically uh, the crosswalks that we have implemented at Dataside, and then there's two libraries, which is actually uh, the first ones that exist, code meta, for example, and R is written by one of the um, project leads for code meta, so Carl Petita. Um, but as I said, once we have sorted out the metadata standardization, code meta version three, and putting this into schema.org or kicking it off, the focus of the work should be on tooling and adoption. Um, that what can you do if you want to generate code meta file? Um, and also even being aware this exists, uh, there, there's just a lot of work to do. We have some ideas about a workshop in September, but right now the focus is on um, sort of finalizing the code meta three version. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Okay, so we are on time and I think this uh, was great. Uh, we will now have an open discussion and Q&A. So first, I would like to thank, uh, thank you to all the speakers for excellent talks. It was really great, very, very informative. And for staying with us uh, just a little bit longer for this uh, open discussion. Um, so just to say we are going to stay in the same room and maybe I think that it should be fine that maybe people who have questions, they can potentially just uh, unmute themselves and ask the question. Um, but actually, I will leave this to Dorothy, who is going to chair the open discussion. So Dorothy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So OK, so before we dive deeply in the discussion, now it's a possibility to ask questions to our speakers. So thanks again for the excellent talks. Um, we have in the chat so far a quite lively discussion between Slava and Afon, and I'm not sure if the question is now uh, answered or Slava, if, uh, if you want to discuss further um, unmuted. Um, so uh, basically the, the question here uh, is about uh, reproducibility. So if some notebook is connected to a data stored in Dataverse, and of course data can change, so how to make sure that it will be reproducible if something will change in date? Yeah, I mean, I, I left some comments in the chat. Um, I think if the data is in Dataverse, I, I have to confess I'm not an expert on the uh, way in which, uh, like how um, fine-grained the versioning is that's available in Dataverse. So, you know, I think um, the repo to Docker um, workflow I was showing there is about the, I would say the computational environment um, rather than the for sort of full reproducibility. So I think, you know, I think having some uh, concept of, you know, version checking when you start the notebook, I think this is a thing that ultimately is sort of up to authors or implementers um, to, to do that work. I don't think uh, I would claim that what I was showing was, you know, sort of com complete reproducibility, guaranteed reproducibility. I think this is more about making sure that the notebook has a good chance of running. Um, but of course, uh, for a for sort of to be sure of that, you would want to put some additional logic or uh, behavior in place to uh, to ensure that the the data was part of that versioning story. To the caveat to that is. My, my understanding of how repo to Docker works is that if the data is persisted in the repository, then that would be versioned. And so, so it obviously have to be smaller if it was within GitHub, but that would then, um, the container image that gets built 
would reflect the version of the data too, but that's that's not, I think, your question. I think you're saying if it's an external data source, so I think it's uh, part of the part of the story, but not all of it for sure. It's a good question. Yeah, I have a small comment. I had to uh, confess that I have not read the discussion in the chat, so maybe this is going to be a little bit off. But uh, I have um, so the integration in between Dataverse and MyBinder.org. It works well. So I, yeah, I use with this like data sets and uh, notebooks and uh, um, uh, yeah, wall of care, uh, cares. Uh, okay, I, uh, every time I would have this like requirements file uh, in the Dataverse repository, I didn't have any problems with reproducibility and rerunning the, the notebook as, as it should be in, in Binder. So that, but yeah, I now understand that there might be like a, a external dependencies, but um, yeah, just to say that with smaller projects, it works very well from my experience. Okay. We have a comment from Daniel Katz about the Cognita generator. Um, so this is already uh, 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 getting some discussion in the chat about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm not sure that we need to necessarily talk about it here. It's, I think it's a level of detail that's probably not uh, of interest to everybody, I would guess. Okay. If I can comment briefly on this, I think uh, my point was only about there's a better data standard. There will be a million different ways how you get there. And the form is probably fine for some people. Others probably want to get as much metadata as possible automatically from what they have, for example, because it's, uh, it's already in, in R or Python um, registered package. A lot of metadata is there. Um, I don't want to, apparently um, YAML file is a sensitive topic, but there's also something called citation file format. So if anything, there's too many ways you can uh, put better data and it's really just at the end of the day to agree on a file format, how it's described. And I think what matters is, is the thing to do that. Um, and um, yeah, my experience, with working with code matter and the things you want for software, if you want to uh, register this, is, is that typically in a code repository, you have 80% of the metadata that you need. And especially things that are sort of everything that's about scholarly credit and so forth, which is author, both listing the authors, which is very different from code committers often, and also the specific contribution that and that's the territory where I think right now, that's probably mostly manual and that's not something where it can automate and the sort of the code repository just spits it out when, when you do release. Uh, but hopefully this looks different in five years where there's sort of, just as often has shown for JOS, uh, that there is sort of automation workflows where there's just a minimal interaction by people to just add what is missing, but not, not make this painful and sort of that nobody's using it. Yeah, big challenge is how to pull that metadata out of people, right? I find sometimes if you just get the kind of slightly wrong metadata first, then it's easier to correct it. Like if you just call people by their GitHub name and then realize they realize, I don't want to be stated as, you know, data guy. They want to have the real name in there. Then they will start fixing it, right? But that means you need the kind of iterative loop to get the metadata updated and contributed to. Okay, so we have a question from Ugo Mushini. Um, if my research project has already produced shared data sets and data versus publications in Zenodo and code in GitHub, what would be the best place to store the, our create linking and grouping all these project outputs as a metadata object in each of the repositories? Yeah, so it's a good question about granularity, right? So the kind of, I see the role of our credit is two parts. One is to, you know, just be a holder of that kind of metadata that goes alongside something. So it, it could naturally fit alongside in each of these repositories, in which case they would be different our crates. But a more important part is to be a bringing together thing, right, where you are referencing all these things that already exist and existing in other repositories. Uh, using DOIs and so on where they are, uh, where they already exist, 
and the only thing you have now left now is where do I put this new array creator basically gathers the other and that could be in Sonoda, could be in Dataverse, it could just be on your website, but probably a, an actual repository makes more sense. This is where it would be nice to have a bit more integration so that metadata can be lifted from the array crate and up into that repository. But it is kind of new to these repositories to have such kind of meta deposits because they are just pure collections with no act, there's no files to download, they're all by reference. And we need to have much more work on that because that's where you get this compound uh, attribution thing where we have different attribution, different licenses and so on. But that's the reality. Think things are not going into one separate repositories and we can't force everyone to change either, right? We have to allow for things to live in multiple places. And the best way to allow that is to collect identifiers as much as you can. So you can go back and forward between them. Thanks a lot. Um, and we have a question from Joachim Philipson to Martin Fenner um, relating to previous question, giving the development work and the integration of code meter with schema.org. You would not dissuade people from using those tools, this code meter P right now for adding code meter, or will there be future compatibility between versions? So I think one important part of the initial discussion when we started this task force is our goal is not to sort of kill code matter, let it sort of dissolve into schema.org. Uh, for the specific question, I think um, because code matter is already almost schema.org, I think there's, that should be a straightforward to sort of transition. Um, but the other part that was even more important discussion was that code matter is a community. And uh, the schema community, schema law community is, is worries about so many other things that uh, meta about software source code would just fall fall off the table and be neglected. So we definitely want to continue having a, a group of people who worry about um, metadata for software source code. And that includes, of course, all the practical things of um, updating existing tooling, et cetera, but also just um, what things do you want to have in code meta version four and what is sort of missing or what evolves over time in metadata that are important, et cetera. Um, and Dan, who is sort of co-chair of the force level, reminds me that now is a good time to uh, at least go to the code meta repository and provide feedback to uh, the, the things that are there. There's many issues about um, what should be code meta 3.0. Um, that there's sort of lots of ideas uh, described in issues. Most of them are not like controversial, but if there's something that is missing you want to see in there or something you have strong opinions about, now is a good time. Um, the task force will probably wrap up soon enough. So I think doing practical things uh, in the Cormeta repo is a good start. If you if you want to join our calls, that's also possible. It's probably easiest if you just ping me then. Okay, we. I think the 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 other code meter uh, uh, according um, from Stian. This was a, a comment and not a question. That's right. Um, about code meter moving to the profile of schema.org. <clears throat> yeah, I see. I see a kind of alignment to the same way of doing it, both in code meter and our grade. In that we are just saying how could you use something as schema or that. And with a few bits and bobs extra where they haven't managed to add the pull request we asked for. And, that, and that's what allowed me to just pull uh, the JSON LD you had from Dataverse and put it in the R -Quit tooling and it kind of worked. And I just tried that right now while Martin was talking to use the code meta from code meta. And that also worked in the R -Quit tooling with the other bob, bits and bobs missing, but it's, it does what allows the actual interoperability that we agree not just on the format, but also the vocabulary, but also allowing scientists to fill in their own 
uh, vocabularies. Which was discussed in vocabulary session, I think yesterday, right? About having specialized vocabularies as well. But having a core metadata model, which is allowed this interoperability. So we have another question to ask from Samuel Bernando. About GitHub API moving to GraphQL and moving of REST, what is expected with version 4? So I think, uh, firstly, I can't really speak for the platform team at GitHub, so I'm not particularly familiar with the, uh, the roadmap there. I, my understanding is that you can really consider the GraphQL API is version 4. Um, I don't believe there is any plan to deprecate the version 3 REST API. Uh, at this point. Um, GraphQL is incredibly helpful for some um, integrators. Uh, in particular, you know, there are certain types of um, ways in which you might want to integrate with GitHub where GraphQL makes sense because you want to do more complex queries or you want to return a smaller, smaller, more targeted payload for your application. Um, but there are still there's still an enormous amount of use of the V3 API, so I don't think uh, that's that's kind of my view of the world. Uh, but again, I, I I can't really speak for sort of longer term changes, but that's my current understanding. Happy to happy to answer any more specific things if you want, or find the right team who might be able to help. Okay. So thanks again to all the speakers and um, all the questions. As I see no new question in the chat, I would just shortly share my screen and um, show the survey results. So 21 of you have, um, have answered the, the few fast and uh, really last minute questions we asked for you. Thanks a lot for this. Um, and what we asked was, um, Firstly, what kind of software do you or researchers from your community want to publish on DataWorth? And what we can see in the results so far, so this is mostly about scripts, Jupyter Notebooks, containers, and also releases of source code of research software, not so much about executables and about data packages with some code. Um, what you also ask is, so why? Um, what are the reasons for your searches from your community to publish software? So we see here, it's mainly about to enable research reproducibility and all the other reasons to do this, to receive a DOI, to enable easy code citation for visibility, long time achieving and meet requirements are also nearly quite, quite, um, as important as each other. Okay, so we also asked, so what kind of integrations or interfaces should data was offer to other tools um, to be of use for you and your software? So we see here 90% would like to have an integration with GitHub, GitLab, or something like this. We are CI CD pipelines. We have 66% like to have um, interface to repository for virtual containers where clothes and other are artifacts. Um, and then nearly over 50% of the participants like to have integration with external execution environments or also automatic extraction of software metadata from existing files. So we ask a bit more about um, the metadata for, for software as we are currently working on the metadata block basing on code meter for data words. Um, so ask what is important for you to describe your software um, and see, so mostly important is information for citation, for author title version PID, and also for docs and helps, like links to the documentation issue trackers contact. Um, also information to run and develop like the dependencies, programming language platform or something like this. And not so important, but still for a lot of participants, quite important information about use cases, about the research someone can do with this, um, with this software. So as CodeMeter is um, 
yeah, entails nearly all the information about citation run and develop docs and help the use cases is so this part of information that is not entailed in code meter much so about what kind of software can you do with this part of, of, of code or this part of software. And so we asked one other question, especially about this. Um, so how could one describe the, the research can do with the software? So the research part of the research software part and metadata that. And we have here some ideas about package sources and versions, machine specs, um, reproducibility badges to give this basic methodology information from the actual project, use the software, the implemented model or method, application scenarios, input output formats, parameters, direct citations to research outputs that use the software, so links, um, documentation with code snippets, projects, preprints, presentations, so also links to other that are linked to this software. Readme's as the first step, series of properties like licenses at the second step. So would be interesting what kind of properties this could be. Context use cases, examples of relevant existing research. So I think there is still discussion needed to, to see how we could represent this in, in metadata. <clears throat> Okay, then about how should data was enable creating or depositing um, software metadata? So this is also about metadata. How should it get in into data was? So um, most of you um, find most important the manual creation over the UI, um, but nice to have a possibility to upload structured files via the API or to extract automatically um, information from code meter files that are uploaded via the UI. And um, I think for the last question, also there was a question, is there anything like two different ways of thought to handle software and code? So like the one capture data code environments and workloads in one package, and the second one to create distinct publications and link to each other. And we see that um, nearly every one of you um, think we need these both approaches for different scenarios. Okay, so I think we are quite uh, far in the discussion uh, so far and we have not many much time left and Anna wants to talk a bit about a project with her, um, with her students. So I would give the floor to her and um, just if you have a further discussion points, just put them in the chat and perhaps we have a few more minutes at the end <clears throat> to handle that. Yeah, thank you. This was a really, really interesting, um, uh, interesting, interesting results, a very interesting discussion and everything I think was great. Uh, I would just like to follow up on, um, on the previous question. So um, um, maybe if Dorothy wants to show the slide again, Slide number eight. So we had the question was uh, that we had two schools of thoughts. So first one to capture data code environment for close everything in one package, kind of like mapping what we heard from Stian. So arrow create approach. And then the second one is uh, to create distinct publications for data like we have right now in Dataverse and also code, uh, for example, with code meta, what uh, Martin presented. So we kind of wanted to see what people um, wanted uh, what people voted for without necessarily being direct about it and the uh, good thing this is that uh, everyone okay not many people who, who, uh, who participated in the survey but the vast majority of those people want uh, both things to be implemented so to kind of like have in a sense arrow create approach and also code meta appro approach uh, within dataverse so i think that's great and just shows that i think we really did uh, well with this uh, session today uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so maybe I can use a few last minutes to just quickly mention the project that I've been uh, working on with, uh, with students from uh, Boston University. Uh, so that Danny suggested because, um, yeah, um, 
So we had a small collaboration over the past years and I was collaborating with uh, five students from Boston University and they were kind of like building external tools that are relevant for Dataverse. And we are I'm mentioning them here because they're also uh, relevant for reproducibility and for also this session. So what they did is that they created two tools. Our first one being something like continuous integration tool. So in a sense that uh, when when a researcher would upload their code and the data to, data to, to a repository, the, the code would immediately be re-executed. Um, and then the researcher could see if the re-execution is successful or not, and what are the product files, and get this like interactive view whether their code is uh, going to be published, re-executable uh, re or not. And then they can act on it and then upload the modified code. I hope that makes sense. So kind of like uh, checking re-execution on the move. And then the second project that students work on was on code readability. So uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, introductory uh, talk, we want to enable reuse, we want to enable transparency. And one of the important aspects of that is that the code be readable. <laughs> so uh, the students then created a survey and a machine learning model that will rate readability of code. And then again, when the when code, say hypothetically, it is uploaded to Dataverse, Dataverse would uh, say, uh, would rate the code and say, uh, return the information whether it is readable or not. And if not, how this code can be improved. Like for example, break out, uh, break um, some of the lines or add more comments or something to kind of like improve the overall picture of the data set. Uh, so uh, we had a little bit of a uh, discussion whether the students should uh, present here, but um, I mean, this is kind of like more, I feel, uh, technical implementation of, um, of uh, metadata, and this is a little bit different discussion. So the students actually presented yesterday uh, in, in the middle of the night uh, for, for European time, in European time. So I suggest, uh, I suggest uh, maybe if you want to check out uh, what we've done in this project, you should... Uh, have a look at YouTube once uh, uh, Dataverse community meeting um, videos are online. So, and then you can see the students presented and you can see how the project actually, uh, um, yeah, yeah what happened. So kind of like they now finished, graduated, got uh, uh, really, really great, great um, uh, grades. So I think that was really good. So I don't know, is there maybe uh, Dorothy and Oliver? Uh, is there something that we want to conclude this discussion um, with? But yeah, now we are kind of like tying together the previous and uh, this session. So I think that's um, that's good. We are kind of like all cohesive uh, uh, Dataverse meetings. So it's not just uh, one of yeah, just um, please make also sure to watch the recording of Dan Katz's keynote because he also talked a lot about software and making software fair. Um, and uh, uh, please also make sure to watch the video on the external vocabularies and uh, the licensing that happened yesterday. Um, many good things coming. And yeah, thank you all for listening and watching. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you to all the speakers and everyone who joined. I think it was it was a great session. And of course, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer and follow up our email or anything. But, uh, and yeah, if of interest, uh, consider joining our, work, our working group at Dataverse. <laughs> OK. One thing I didn't get to talk about was how how is Dataverse seeing out like for storing large binaries and things that are kind of halfway useless, kind of like intermediate data, container images, that kind of things that we're kind of struggling to archive on the fly, but may need it later. Is, is that something you have been looking at in terms of software preservation and things like that? Yeah, it's, it's a, it is a good discussion. I think, um... Yeah, yeah, for now, I think that all, say, containers are deposited with just Docker files. And there is um, kind of like a workflow where people upload something via uh, CodeOcean. And then that, uh, that package is uh, uh, 
exported from Code Ocean and then saved in Dateverse, and then we would have only uh, Docker files for these containers. But uh, however, on the other hand side, there is a lot of uh, like archive archived files in Dateverse. So yeah, these are definitely not very transparent. Um, so that's, yeah, that's definitely a little bit of a problem. I think that there is a little bit of interest in creating a, a container repository, but I think that would be kind of like a big, uh, big step um, because yeah, kind of like additional infrastructure would need to be created. And then also not all containers are the same. So then which one you would want to support. So it's uh, yeah, maybe high hanging fruit for now. But uh, I, I was very yeah, impressed with um, with all this, like uh, with kind of like small integration that you've done already with Dataverse exporting uh, our uh, Bagit uh, and uh, having everything in a human readable format. So that was really cool. Definitely a low hanging fruit as uh, Oliver mentioned. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, Taking the we might, we, we might trick one of the new students to implement that properly. So have a go at that. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, finish the session. I think there's like in fifteen minutes going to be a new one, so uh, better better uh, leave people to have a cup of coffee. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Great, uh, great sharing. <laughs> I think we were a good team.